Hey everybody, welcome back from a short break. We're gonna move from the past to the present uh, now in the symposium. Um, we'll have three speakers, um, Doug Comer, Tom Cassidy and Ray Savajo, who will um, begin shortly and then each of them will speak and then we'll have a uh, group discussion with some Q and A. So start thinking about what questions you'll have for these folks. Um, you've all met Doug Comer, our president. Uh, Tom Cassidy is a board member who has spent many years at both the National Trust for Historic Preservation, the Nature Conservancy and American Rivers, among many, or, uh, many other uh, eras of accomplishment. And Ray Savajo is the current associate director of the National Park Service for Natural Resources and Science. Um, Doug? Hello, this is Doug Comer again. I'm going to be talking for the next few minutes about the management expectations for World Heritage Sites uh, pursuant to the World Heritage uh, Convention. And with that, I'm going to share my screen. I have a few slides that we hope will help illustrate what we're going to be discussing. Um, so most of the, um, most of the relevant, let's see here, the official guidance for this, there we go, come from the operational guidelines for the implementation of the World Heritage Convention. And these guidelines are updated um, quite, quite frequently, and uh, they were just uh, updated actually uh, last year in 2021, so they're pretty pretty current. Um, they really focus on the retention of the authenticity and integrity of the criteria that were used to establish the outstanding universal value, which of course is what must be established to inscribe a site on the World Heritage List. And as you might expect, over time, the focus or the emphasis given to certain points in this document, in the operational guidelines, have, has shifted. I'll mention a couple of ways that that has happened. Um, first of all, there's been a shift in the notion, the actual notions of authenticity and integrity. Um, this was reflected in something called the NARA document uh, that was put together about 25 years ago. And this is very interesting and has a lot of implications for how we think about uh, the management of World Heritage Sites and I think uh, heritage sites in general, because in Japan, for example, there are sites that are destroyed as a part of a ritual every 20 years and then rebuilt in exactly the same way using materials from exactly the same location. Their rituals are the same, the building procedures are the same. So there's continuity of intangible culture that in that society, as is as important as the materiality. It is given materiality, but really the the consistency and the integrity and the authenticity comes from this intangible culture that's passed down from generation to generation. Over on the right of this slide, what you see is uh, the uh, one of the Jamon sites, sort of fascinating sites, very early, had some of the earliest pottery uh, produced in the world very sophisticated culture. And those structures that you see are shelters that were built over uh, sites that were excavated very, very carefully. I've been there, uh, was involved with this. Amazingly well excavated and those shelters are so positioned so as not to damage or disturb the remaining archeological uh, materials beneath them. And they are also used for interpreting these sites. It's very difficult to interpret these sites without the presence of those. So uh, this is uh, kind of an expansion of that term. And I think, you know, in many ways, this is relevant to sites all over the world, including the Hopewell nomination um, that we're putting forward uh, next year for the United States. <clears throat> also, um, the uh, engagement involvement of indigenous groups. and. And, and this really goes back to this idea 
of intangible culture that's associated with materiality. So much more attention is given to the involvement of indigenous groups and their continuing association with world heritage sites. And then finally, something I think is very important, monitoring. Uh, UNESCO has a couple of standard monitoring approaches that are built into the procedures. One is the periodic monitoring, or which, which happens every year. Um, and so World Heritage Sites are supposed to prepare this report uh, on the status of the uh, conservation of the site, again, with reference, heavy reference to authenticity and integrity. And then there can be reactive monitoring. If someone points out a problem at a World Heritage Site, um, people are dispatched from UNESCO to examine that problem. But from a day to day, on a day to day basis, as people at the Park Service know, monitoring, uh, it's really needs to be integrated with management and for management decisions. And so there's been much more attention, as we'll see, uh, to that. Um, the protection and management of the nominated property uh, management plan is required, and one is generated, it must be generated. Um, and the um, this is a very, 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 I think that sometimes the process is as, as important as the product. Um, it, there's a difference, as everybody knows, between making a plan and following a plan. And this is, uh, we'll see examples of that, or we, one sees examples of that uh, in many ways, but that's part of uh, what must be described when one is applying for uh, inscription of a site on the World Heritage List. And I should say that there are many UNESCOs and other publications that deal with the development of management plans for World Heritage Sites, these don't have the force of uh, official policy. They're not required in terms of the formal application, but they inform the formal applications. And there's some very good information that's available uh, to people that are putting together nomination dossiers uh, for, for sites being nominated uh, to the World Heritage List. The uh, this is a quote from uh, a section 5E uh, from the operational guidelines. And what this calls for, it, I've highlighted in, in, in yellow, I think the important points, assurances of the effective implementation, a copy of the management plan or documentation of the management system, um, a timetable for the implementation of the management plan. Now, so what this, what this suggests is that the management plan does not have to be in place and doesn't have to be in operation. And so the shadow falls between the thought and the and the action. I think Kierkegaard said that um, in many cases, and I've worked at World Heritage Sites all around the world by this time of my career, uh, the plan, the system is described, but is not um, put together in such a way as it can be easily implemented. And just not to pick out, I've, I've crossed out the name of the World Heritage Site uh, in this case. Um, but you see, in an effort to involve all the stakeholders, in some cases we come up with this, and this, this kind of a diagram that's supposed to describe how the management is going to be done. But when it comes time to actually do this, how does one make a decision? And that's the hard part, you know, coming up with an integrated management approach, really an umbrella approach that's overseen by an organization that has the ability to conduct a unified and consistent program of planning, design, and construction and management. Um, rather than, and certainly everybody has a voice, C certainly everybody has a voice, and we're very familiar with this in the U.S. National Park Service, where we're constantly in touch with stakeholders, including politicians, um, but figuring out who is going to be the point person, how to take input from these various organizations while still retaining the ability to move ahead 
with planning and then with design, with construction um, and day-to-day -day management, that is a real challenge. There's a increasing emphasis on visitation and how that affects the site. Um, I've been involved with tracking this for Machu Picchu um, for care capacity there, for example, and there we plotted the movement of people through the site very carefully. And this is what is needed in order to eliminate crowding in certain places, which can be very destructive, both physically and, of course, impair the visitor experience. So these kind of data really need to be uh, collected and integrated into the management operations. Uh, another reason that this kind of research needs to be structured in such a way that it's easily conveyed to management decision makers and then who can adjust program activities and policies accordingly. Another example here, another site I've been involved with actually at Petra. Um, at one time, we allowed people to uh, sit in the in the theater, this this Romanesque theater that was built in Petra, but by monitoring the wear and tear on the sandstone, we discovered that that activity really needed to be uh, eliminated. So it's very important to know what people are doing on the site, obviously. Indigenous peoples, and this is, you know, if you look at the guidance given in the official documents here, it says demonstrate the extent of consultation and collaboration with indigenous peoples as applicable in the management of the nominated property. Well, I've worked at the Ngorgo Crater World Heritage Site and, and you know, the Maasai uh, peoples uh, have villages there and they are just, it's a magnificent, lovely, wonderful culture, but it's a constant process of communication with them. They have cattle and the uh, in Gorgo Crater has the largest concentration of, of uh, predators, um, possibly in the world, certainly in Africa. Um, and so the Maasai keep cattle, so it's a constant negotiation with them. Where are you going to graze your cattle? How many cattle? And if you can't graze your cattle, can we compensate that to a certain extent? by bringing visitors to your sites, which they enjoy very much, and they can vent to them. Um, it, so we have a plan. Again, there's a difference between planning and management. And I think that the sometimes planning is more valuable than the plan itself. And that's because the people that should be involved with planning um, actually should become involved with management. They need the generation of management skills to really implement some of these excellent and very necessary ideas that are laid out in what should be done at World Heritage Sites. This is very important uh, in terms of both social and economic benefit at World Heritage Sites. And again, something the Park Service prides itself on doing very well, and they do. And I, again, I've worked at sites and wood systems basically on every continent and if you're with the park service of course you see the flaws but i would say that we do it better than well australia might disagree um, and some other places might disagree but we do a good job and there's i think much that we could learn i'm just everything from visitor design but also the function of the staff and how they guide people safely or you know, present the site in a way that can be safely visited uh, and provide the visitor services that are absolutely necessary so that people can really appreciate the site. And then this is a wonderful emphasis that's been given uh, in the operational guidelines. Key indicators for measuring the state of conservation. So here we go with monitoring. And monitoring, I remember I, I mentioned the monitoring that's done um, by the periodic and reactive missions, it's not really enough, not, not really to influence management decision-making and the formulation of activities, programs, policies. This 
ongoing monitoring is so incredibly important and it's so incredibly important because it's got to be dovetailed it's got to feed right into management and i think this is another way that the u.s national park service has learned this lesson um, has learned it over the previous decades and has really developed the capacity to do this um over here on the right you see indicators instruments and standards that were set for Petra and really following a, a National Park Service model for all of that. Um, now with that, I'm going to end my presentation. I think I've given uh, a number of ideas and issues that are so relevant and so top of mind to UNESCO in terms of the day-to-day -day management and the strategic management of World Heritage Sites. And I hope that we can discuss these uh, in great detail um, in, the, uh, in the discussion that we'll have later. But thank you so much for your attention and uh, I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. You're up, Tom. Okay, thank you, Destry. Thank you, Doug. Um, so I'm Tom Cassidy. I'm on the board of U.S. ICOMOS, and I'm here to give some, um, to discuss what the World Heritage Convention adds to the protection of World Heritage Sites in the United States. Ariana, can you move this the forward? Okay, very good. So, and go to the next slide, please. So, you can't walk into court, federal court, and say the Park Service or anybody else is not complying with the World Heritage Convention. Um, there are no specific statutory or regulatory protections that apply to World Heritage Sites. However, there are two significant impacts of listing. First, as we all know, it is an acknowledgement of the international importance of a place and a responsibility to protect its outstanding universal values. Certainly Bill Riley spoke very um, powerfully to those impacts earlier uh, this morning. Second, there's the possibility of including a World Heritage Site on the list of World Heritage in Danger that is also maintained by the World Heritage Committee, and it identifies a condition and calls for action to protect the site. That has both domestic and international political and advocacy significance, including, uh, and I would underscore the, the potential legal um, and financial resources. What I'm going to do in this presentation, we will explore how World Heritage Site status has been used to protect and advocate for five particular places in the United States. Next slide. So the first of these is Everglades National Park, the, rivers, the river of grass. It became a national park in 1947. It is iconically natural Florida. Um, however, it has been endangered for decades by development beyond the park borders. In 1993, the park was added to the World Heritage in Danger list, in part because of the severe impacts of Hurricane Andrew. Um, but also it reflected all of those things that had been endangering the park since before the hurricane. And those included nutrient pollution from upstream agricultural activities, urban growth on the edges of the Everglades, and just a really significant alteration of the natural water flows of the river of grass. Um, so the listing adding the park to the list of world heritage in danger, it really supported longstanding and also future state and federal actions because the state of Florida was doing 
a lot. People wanted them to do more. We still would like the state of Florida to do more. And the United States was acting. Um, there remains things that can be done. In 2007, the, the Bush administration requested the World Heritage uh, Committee to remove the park from the list of World Heritage in danger, citing progress in rehabilitating the park. Um, that was not a universally held perspective. So in 2009, the Obama administration requested that the park be added back to the list of World Heritage in danger due to the continuing threats that still persisted um, since the original listing. And so then in 2010, the World Heritage Committee did return, did act to return the park to the list of World Heritage in danger because of these continued threats. Next slide, please. Um, another example involves Glacier Bay National Park. And I wanted to highlight this because of the role, kind of a, um, a role in, of international advocacy that to a degree, well, I'll get into that. So in 1992, Glacier Bay National Park was added to the World Heritage List. And in that same time frame, there was a very active coalition of conservation groups in Canada, in the US, and elsewhere, uh, including Australia, where they had had the experience of having um, a World Heritage Site endangered by uh, dam construction. And that, it was the Franklin River, and that controversy led to the river being protected and the government relied upon the World Heritage Treaty for its actions to do that. Federal, federal law in Australia is very different from what we have here. So those actions could not be replicated per se, but the, there was very much a notion that we had to draw, and I was a part of this effort uh, in my capacity with American Rivers at the time. We knew we had it to raise the profile. And we were, you know, contacting the Embassy of Canada, the Canadian government, the provincial government, and also the World Heritage Committee. And the World Heritage Committee supported these concerns of, of the United States. And it reminded Canada of its obligations under the convention. Um, I know for a fact that when the premier of Canada visited President Clinton um, in 1993, traditionally that's the first chief of, um, of state meeting that the president has, this controversy involving the Tatchenshini River and the Alsac River was raised by by Canada. I would note that Vice President Gore, who was at the lunch also, had been the sponsor of a resolution in the Congress calling upon, calling for the protection of this place. Um, then in 1993, there was this dramatic announcement by the Premier of British Columbia to create a 2.3 million acre wilderness park to block the mine. Um, and then a year later, the World Heritage Committee acted to, in, to include this new provincial park in the by expanding on the list of World Heritage by expanding the existing Kluwani, Wrangell, St. Elias, and Glacier Bay complex of World Heritage sites. And it is now a 25 million acre complex of four contiguous World Heritage sites. I also, you know, we've been talking and far more attention needs to be given to the role of indigenous voices. And there were indigenous voices in this campaign 30 years ago, but they were not as prominent as perhaps they would be now. But the, um, the local native corporation downstream uh, and north of Glacier, north of Glacier Bay Park, it was Yak Tat Quan Inc. 
uh, the Village Corporation, they wrote a letter that described the, it would, would have been a massive tailings pond and dam for the mining waste, highly acidic, toxic mining waste. They described that tailings dam as, quote, an imminent lake of genocide to the Klingit people of the coast of Alaska. And that was a voice that they had uniquely. And it was an incredibly powerful expression of the importance and the significance of this, uh, of this place. And it was certainly a part of the advocacy campaign that was underway. If we could go to the next slide, please. So our first national park here in the US, or I guess anywhere, Yellowstone National Park, it was also added to the list of world heritage in danger. And that happened because there was a law, there was a gold mine proposal literally upstream and outside of Yellowstone National Park on National Forest Service land that threatened the park. And a fairly significant campaign was underway because advocates knew that we would have to get, to stop a mine under the mining laws of the United States, we would have to get the president of the United States involved. And that was the goal. Um, we, and, and to do that, you've got to just raise the profile through as many means that you can leverage. It included four editorials in the New York Times calling upon the president to protect Yellowstone and stop the mine. The coalition also contacted the World Heritage Committee advocating for, include, for including the park on the list of world heritage. We had an interesting situation because of course, the National Park Service within the Department of the Interior has jurisdiction over the park, but the mine was being proposed on national forest land upstream. So the Department of the Interior also notified the committee that the park was in danger and it, re it requested a visit of the World Heritage Committee that took place in December 90, 1995. And that led to adding the park to the list of World Heritage because of the gold mine proposal, but also the other environmental threats to the park, introduction of non-native fish into Yellowstone Lake. Um, and there were other issues, forestry coming up to the border um, outside of the park. So in 1996, the campaign to stop the New World Mine and to protect Yellowstone from that threat was successful when President Clinton visited the park and announced the settlement that, led, that involved the mine company withdrawing their mine proposal and agreeing to a, a financial settlement to compensate them for, for the mine. And then in, uh, in 2003, the World Heritage Committee removed the park um, from the World Heritage in Danger list, recognizing the progress in addressing the issues that led to its listing. Next slide, please. Another example of the convention being brought into a, a controversy, again, like the Glacier Bay controversy, a transboundary conflict with our, um, our friends in Canada. So Waterton Glacier International Peace Park was added to the list of World Heritage in Danger, uh, to the World Heritage List in 1995. Um, this is Glacier National Park in Montana, and Waterton Park in Canada, and they, they're adjacent to each other. So in the, in the 90s and the early 2000s, con conservationists were very concerned with potential degradation of the Flathead River, which is one of the boundaries of the park, uh, and the park due to proposed coal mines and natural gas development, both in Montana and British Columbia. And in response to 
a lot of international advocacy and actions in certainly in Montana by Senators Baucus and Tester um, in 2009 in response to this advocacy and a request for World Heritage in Danger listing, there was a joint UNESCO IUCN monitoring mission to the park. The report concluded that if the mining proposals were to proceed, it would adversely impact the outstanding universal values and warrant adding to the World Heritage in Danger list. And all of the issues that had been bubbling up were then resolved in significant part in the next year when Montana and British Columbia and representatives of the First Nations agreed to protect the Flathead watershed, including preventing mining on uh, 400,000 acres. So that is, you know, another, well, that is actually, it was, it was um, advocacy that was around world heritage in danger, but action prevented listing. So if we could have the next slide, Ariana. And then we had um, earlier today, a discussion of uh, Taos Pueblo. And this is an, act, an, an example of really innovative administrative actions um, that are not, um, that were impactful. So in 92, Taos Pueblo was added to the World Heritage List. And then at about the same time, the, the Federal Aviation Agency began planning a run, runway expansion at Taos Regional Airport. In 1994, the Federal Advisory Council on Historic Preservation initiated its review of impacted historic resources and traditional cultural practices of the Pueblo, Pueblo as are required by Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act. And affected parties included the Pueblo, the National Park Service, and the New Mexico State Historic Preservation Officer. In 2006, the FAA determined that the world heritage status of the Pueblo, due to its living culture, merited actions outside the usual range of Section 106 mitigation. Um, and in 2011, a memorandum of, of agreement was signed that included FAA advisories about the Pueblo's unique culture and avoidance of flights over the Pueblo and adjacent wilder and an adjacent wilderness area. And this was an unprecedented act by the FAA to voluntarily restrict overflights of a historic property with exceptional historic significance. And it is it is cited, this case, this case study is cited as um, a very significant success story as it is um, for the use of Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act. So those are kind of a suite of examples of how world heritage status has led to successful advocacy to protect these world heritage sites. So thank you. So Ray, you're up next, my friend. Just jump right in and then we'll get to the panel discussion after you finish. That sounds good. I'll be sharing my screen. Um, so uh, this was, uh, this was the, the last two presentations I think were a really excellent segue into um, some of the issues that I'm gonna talk about, which are less directly about World Heritage Sites specifically, but more about the efforts of the National Park Service to establish an inventory and monitoring program focused on natural resources and the relevance of that work toward natural heritage sites. And I think that what we, we just heard um, uh, initially about the role of the, the convention itself, the World Heritage Convention, um, indicating the importance of monitoring will echo through this. And then the examples that we just heard about um, 
in terms of uh, the, the, the threats to particular sites and the, the role of information, data and information to inform the uh, advocacy and ultimate protection of these sites all point to the importance of having information about the status and condition of the resources within World Heritage Sites. Um, and so I'm going to talk again specifically about efforts by the National Park Service to establish an inventory and monitoring program um, that I think is relevant to World Heritage Sites. And of course, the U.S. National Park Service does have World Heritage Sites as well. So th this could be broadly applicable, um, but there are some advantages and disadvantages and challenges as well, and I'll try to touch on those too. Um, I know that just really quickly what I'll run through is um, kind of the, the context of this effort by talking about the parks, the National Park Service and the National Park System, uh, the relevance and importance of inventory and monitoring. We've already touched on that and we'll touch on it again. Um, but then I want to spend a little bit of time talking more specifically about the organization of the inventory and monitoring program um, by the National Park Service across the National Park System. Um, and then and with a brief discussion about World Heritage Site relevance, but my hope is that this will um, segue again into the conversations and the discussions that we'll have um, about, about this. And so that's my hope is that that will be a, an entree into the, the panel discussion. The U.S. National Park System, of course, I'm sure as probably nearly everyone that's listening here is familiar with is over 400 units that are scattered across the United States and, and offshore islands. Uh, so it's a very expansive system that includes an incredible diversity of units um, of varying sizes and different individual um, purposes and enabling legislation uh, and resource values. And among those, of course, are parks that have significant natural resource values. And so 300, some 300 or so parks have what, what were termed um, a number of years ago as having, quote, significant natural resources. And these typically are the larger parks that have um, major ecosystems within their boundaries. But of course, you know, arguably every park has some important natural resources within them. Um, but these were the sort of key ones that were focused on um, as parks within which critical natural resources form an important basis of the establishment of that park and for which it is critical to understand kind of the trajectory and the status of the natural resources within that park um, because that understanding is critical for management purposes. Um, so natural resource inventory and monitoring, um, we've already heard a lot about this, but the kinds of things that the National Park Service has pointed to and has continued, you know, pointed to decades ago and has continued to point to today, um, and I'm going to make a, a distinction between inventory work and monitoring work, um, and so work that involves actually understanding what is out there you know, what, what kinds of resources are there uh, and their distribution, and then the status of those research resources. What is the trajectory of change that may be occurring? And so there's the inventory component and then the monitoring, the watching these resources over time. All of this information is critical for park planning and understanding the actions by the park agency itself. So sensitive park planning and development uh, of course, improved resource management decision making, understanding the status of resources and what will that, you know, suggest about what should or should not occur. And we already heard about, you know, some of the examples of this for uh, World Heritage Sites where understanding um, things like uh, visitor activities and use and how those um, um, activities may affect how one manages resources in those park units. Also performance management, and what I mean by that is understanding if the actions that are being taken, the resource management actions that are being taken, the investments that are being taken by park agencies are in fact achieving their goals. Um, 
and, and even if it's not connected to specific actions, is simply setting aside these areas, helping to protect and or um, uh, preserve the resources. And so um, there are values in understanding status and trends of resources to understand how well investments are actually occurring um, and whether they're appropriate and, and, and um, you know, what other kinds of investments are necessary. And this has a public component as well, public interest component. Um, you know, how are um, you know, taxpayer dollars being spent to help manage resources and parks? And are we actually getting um, out of what we're putting in, in terms of uh, investment? Um, and of course, understanding the resources within park units is critical for the interpretation and outreach and communication about those resources to people, people that are visiting parks, uh, to the public for educational purposes and so forth. Um, and then of course, monitoring resources can provide indications of a need for management intervention. And so looking at long-term ecosystem changes is critically important for understanding if, when, and how to respond to those changes. And of course, the you know enormous, um, especially critical, particular challenge that we're facing is climate change. Um, why do we have an inventory and monitoring program? Well, of course, um, it's the right thing to do because that's how we best manage the resources and understand, but there are some kind of uh, uh, legislative and statutory um, uh, uh, underpinnings to this. And so in 1998, uh, there was actually legislative language that included specific um, expectations that the National Park Service would carry out a systematic, consistent, professional inventory and monitoring program to ensure that decisions are based on sound scientific data. And, and that's always helpful to be able to point back to you know, specific legislation that indicates that need. Uh, a year later, the Natural Resource Challenge came along, which provided um, additional funds. And so, of course, that's a really important factor in determining whether or not you can successfully stand up programs. Um, and then the need and expectation for having inventory and monitoring as a, a key part of how parks are managed is um, also uh, articulated in National Park Service management policies. And so there's a very strong both legal and policy underpinning, as well as fortunately, the funding that was able to help stand up a comprehensive inventory and monitoring program across the national park system. So as the program was developed, there were a series of goals and objectives. So uh, I already mentioned the distinction between the inventory side. So inventorying of natural resources that determine their status, what's out there, monitoring those uh, resources to understand um, change, their dynamic nature. Um, Establishing inventory and monitoring as a standard practice for parks. So trying to spread this expectation to do this work across the national park system. Um, critically important to integrate the results of these efforts into planning, management, and decision making. And then of course, sharing accomplishments. And I would add to this, developing partnerships and leveraging the work of um, National Park Service inventory and monitoring with other agencies, with other organizations, um, and using this information to help inform the public about national parks and park service units. So with these ambitious goals, uh, the challenge of course was then to establish an inventory and monitoring program across the National Park Service, given the complexity that we already talked about, the wide distribution of parks, um, but of course the critical importance of doing this in a way that um, is as helpful as possible in helping us understand resources. And so the, the, the system that, that the National Park Service now embraces, and this has been in place now for some 20 years, is the development of a series of networks, so 32 networks in all, that include these 300 or so parks, that number has gone up a bit, um, but these, these parks that have critical natural resources, each one of these parks, is included in one of the networks. And the networks are generally ecologically based, but there are some uh, other little factors that sort of go into um, the particular boundaries. Sometimes there's a little bit of a, 
uh, administrative and managerial consideration as well. But, but generally, these are ecologically based networks within which a series of parks are identified and included. Um, and the thinking is that they will share similar kinds of resources, not exclusively and not entirely, but in many cases may have overlap in some of the resources. And that will be helpful in helping to um, share capacity and approaches for how um, and what is monitored within each one of these networks. And so you could pick any one of these particular networks and ideally um, there may be opportunities to share expertise um, and to use similar protocols for monitoring resources. Um, and so that was the thinking and that would make the overall effort um, a more cost effective and efficient. Uh, in addition to the development of the networks, there was a series of multi-year efforts to develop baseline inventories so that every park within this broader set of 32 networks was going to have what we call baseline inventories. And so these are the baseline inventories that were the focus of that effort. So every park would have basic air quality information and base cartography and weather and climate data and geologic resources through a geology map, species lists, and so forth. Um, and that work took a number of years, but has reached the point now of completion. And so every park has at least um, uh, a, a similar set of baseline data. The tougher challenge was to determine how to actually develop a monitoring program to look at indicators of ecosystem change uh, identify what those are, and then to actually conduct the work necessary to monitor those resources over time. And so going back to those networks, each network developed what was called a conceptual model for how various factors um, uh, influence the resources. That included a fair amount of information about the natural uh, interactions between various components of ecosystems along with the stressors to those ecosystems, the factors that influence and create impacts to those, um, to those resources. And the use of this kind of high level conceptual model was designed to assist in identifying indicators of change. And so if we can identify what kind of makes the ecosystem tick and then what are some of the stressors or the factors that influence the dynamics of that ecosystem, that should hopefully tell us what are some important indicators of change that will be important for the National Park Service to monitor? And that occurred for each one of those 32 networks. And then from that conceptual model for each network, each network then produced a set of indicators of ecosystem change or what we called vital signs of ecosystem change. And this was done through a very comprehensive effort um, that involved uh, uh, consulting numerous experts, uh, bringing people together to kind of hash out conceptual models, um, identify factors that could be helpful in elucidating the dynamics of those models, um, and uh, going through a, a fairly extensive process to both identify the vital signs and then begin coming up with uh, protocols for how one would actually monitor those vital signs over time. That not surprisingly led to an enormous list of vital sign indicators for each of the networks, um, all of which could not be monitored because there just wasn't sufficient capacity and funding to do that. So that led to a next step of prioritizing those and then determining which ones would ultimately be monitored and setting up protocols that went through an extensive peer review process to actually monitor those indicators over time. Um, and so, 32 networks now have indicators, vital signs of ecosystem change that have been prioritized. And then many of those now are being monitored based on a protocol that was developed. And there are staffing and, and individuals and teams that are now doing that monitoring work and have been doing that work for um, a number of years. And so where we're at now, um, there's over 300 protocols that, that are now being implemented across the national park system that um, you can see the categories there. Most of them are 
related to particular species or species groups, so taxon taxonomic categories. Um, again, um, remembering that these are natural resource uh, values and natural resource components. Um, and then there are some uh, 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 abiotic or kind of physical um, factors, including uh, geologic features and water resources, and um, also measures of landscape scale change. So these, these protocols are now in place and teams go out with consistent frequency. Typically it's annual, but it may be less frequent for some, it may be more frequent for others across the networks of parks. This work has led to direct applications, um, understanding uh, uh, iconic species management, um, contributing to recovery plans for particular species, um, understanding the effectiveness of investments in restoration, in invasive species control, uh, using monitoring protocols as uh, mechanisms for early detection of invasive species, uh, looking at water quality changes and using the information from monitoring to help um, frame mitigation work uh, around water quality. Uh, I mentioned earlier performance management and accountability and, and understanding the state of parks um, so we can use and have used information from the inventory and monitoring program to uh, articulate the trajectory of resources in national parks um, as tools to help the public understand, um, you know, are things getting worse? Are they getting better? What are some of the factors we think are influencing these? And what sorts of actions are important to help um, uh, influence that trajectory? And the biggest, biggest challenge we're facing, and I think still one of the greatest opportunities and important values of the inventory and monitoring effort is responding to the broader changes in, in environments and in parks and, and especially climate change. And we're, we're in a process right now of, of um, working to get more focused attention on the use of inventory monitoring data as well as um, uh, as much as possible, uh, tiering and um, aligning our protocols so that they provide as much timely information about climate change effects as possible. So that is the big picture of our work with inventory and monitoring across the national park system. Um, as I mentioned, and as we all I think have recognized, understanding what you have and understanding how those things are changing is critical to achieve the National Park Service mission, but also as we've learned to um, advance the obligations and expectations of the World Heritage Convention and ensure that World Heritage sites are protected. Um, applying results and communicating these findings, I think are critical. This kind of system, I think could be very, very helpful across World Heritage sites. It provides opportunities to share data and integrate efforts that occur at broader scales and provides and has provided an outstanding opportunity to engage with partners and the public. Um, I want to mention a couple of additional um, aspects of this that I think are especially relevant to uh, world heritage sites and international conservation in general. Um, they're probably the single most common question it, that, that I get from other um, international park managers um, are related to the efforts that we have underway to do inventory and monitoring. And so there's definitely a lot of interest in that. And we do our best to try to follow up with that and provide support and, um, and uh, assistance as much as we can to get these kinds of programs or these kinds of efforts established in other places. Um, uh, I'll just use an example. The, there are parks now across Italy and ideally expanding and beyond um, that are utilizing air quality monitoring that is directly coming out of some of the efforts and the um, techniques that, that the US national parks have been using. And this particular presentation that I just showed now was actually drawn from um, uh, conversations I've had with other countries uh, in, in Europe and in Asia on inventory and monitoring. So there's a lot of interest. 
there are challenges because it requires an enormous amount of investment to do this well, and it requires a long-term commitment. Um, but I think as we all realize, it's also really, really important. Um, and so the challenge is to you know, identify what those key indicators may be and to think about ways to collect effectively the information necessary to monitor their trajectories um, but recognizing that no one is going to have an infinite amount of resources to do this work. Um, so I'll conclude with two last comments. One point of leveraging is in is some an area that we're working a lot more on now across US national parks is the incorporation of public participation in data collection, um, citizen science, things like that, where we can um, help leverage people to um, collect information, and that, of course, has other, you know, additional benefits um, in addition to simply helping collect data. Um, and then I'm going to close by emphasizing that this work was established as part of a natural resource um, investment increase in the National Park Service, but we are continuing to work closely with um, cultural resources and um, cultural resource practitioners, and particularly now in the face of a changing climate, to understand how we can adapt and utilize this information in its application to understanding cultural resources and to actually work collaboratively and with others um, within that cultural resources realm to um, develop similar kinds of um, monitoring that is critically necessary for the amazing variety of historic and cultural research across the national park system, of course, across world heritage sites as well. So I will stop at that point. Thank you. Well, I just want to say, Ray, that was amazing. <laughs> that was an amazing presentation. And you're right. It's precisely what world heritage sites oh. need. And, Sorry about uh, that. I don't want to just jump the gun here, but you know, talking about I, it, the focus seems to be on monitoring natural resources uh, and uh, indicators, natural indicators, and that, kind of, that kind of thing. But you know, there's I'm an archaeologist. There's there's a there's no separation between nature nature and culture. I'll just use an example: Machu Picchu. Everybody thinks of the Yakta, you know, the beautiful stonework and it's magnificent, but Machu Picchu is actually much, much bigger than that. And most of it is natural. And with climate change, I've been working there recently in just, I don't know, six weeks ago, there was a fire that was 11 kilometers away from the Acta. So these, the climate change issues are really going to be affecting not just natural sites, but clearly cultural sites and some of our most important cultural sites. Just make that observation that there's an incredibly close connection between the two. Yeah. Not, not, not to mention the uh, fire on Rapa Nui, uh, that yes. uh, Easter Island, that uh, Chilean island that um, did huge damage to those rock sculptures. Um, yeah. in, in any case, the, the values cross over. Um, Ray, I don't want to put you on the spot, but you know, with all the money that the American um, uh, AGO Act uh, provided for the Park Service with the emphasis on deferred maintenance of facilities on the surface, that doesn't look like that money benefits natural resources. Um, and, it, you know, this is this may look like a tangent, but I, I think there's a uh, good reason to keep talking about, as Doug just did, the integration of um, natural and cultural. You know, when I was assistant director of the Park Service, Roger Kennedy always said, every park is cultural. Um, and uh, I think you can make the case if you dig deeply enough. Um, the cultural side of the Park Service often benefits from these uh, funding programs because there are a lot of buildings and they need deferred maintenance. Um, um, but, you know, as 
as Myrna Palfrey talked this morning, the superintendent at San Juan, you know, storm damage and sea level rise uh, have have great impacts. Um, and the work that the Park Service science programs can do uh, on addressing uh, climate change benefits the cultural side uh, uh, clearly. So what, what um, say a word at least about what you've done. I know you've done some good things to convince the, <laughs> the funders uh, of, of AGO that there's natural resource uh, implications of, uh, or applications of that pot of money. Yeah, no, that's that's a great question. And um, there were, of course, enormous opportunities for the Park Service that opened up with a huge influx of funding. Um, but as we all know, those dollars were geared toward uh, deferred maintenance and infrastructure investments. But what that did was it really, I think, shined a spotlight on the critical importance of wise investments given the rate at which we are seeing ecosystems change. Um, so the critical um, necessity of ensuring that when we make investments around deferred maintenance or when we look at infrastructure or when we look at investments that are helping to um, restore or preserve cultural resources, historic structures, for example, that those investments are done in a way that recognize and are responsive to the changes that we're seeing, whether that's sea level rise or increasing um, risk of wildfire or uh, you know, the list could go on and on. Um, drought, uh, persistent drought, uh, um, higher frequency storms. And so the investments that were have been occurring now are coupled with um, the development of much more, I would say, comprehensive analysis that are geared toward vulnerability assessments of resources, including infrastructure and um, the facilities within parks, uh, vulnerability to climate change. And, if, you know, it's not perfect in that there's, you know, a bunch of money suddenly and, and that money is sort of marching along. But um, I have been really, really encouraged by the collaboration that we've seen that I've been able to experience now working with my counterpart in planning and facility management and within cultural resources to, to literally get together and say, there's, we cannot move these efforts, these investments forward unless we think carefully about the consequences of these investments in the face of a changing climate. Um, and so that information now is very much a front and center consideration as each of the projects that are being proposed under those funding sources come through what is um, originally was called the Development Advisory Board in the National Park Service, but now has evolved into the Investment Review Board. And in fact, that group met just this week. Um, and a critical question that comes up as those projects move forward is, what is this going to look like in five years, in 10 years, in 20 years, in 50 years? What does the investment that is being proposed, um, what are the implications of that, given what we know about climate change? And if there are uncertainties, we need to work to find the answers to address those. And so that's what's happening now. I would also point to the opportunities that we are encouraged by in the near future um, with potential funds that may come um, through the uh, Inflation Reduction Act that might allow us to do even more in terms of these vulnerability assessments and to do what we're, what we're kind of thinking of as focused, um, deeper dives around vulnerability so in coastal environments that are particularly prone to things like high frequency storms or um, sea level rise uh, or areas that are um, really under the pressure of persistent drought, like in the Colorado River watershed um, or areas that we have seen 
changes in fire frequency. Um, so there are common challenges that different parks may face that really necessitate a deeper dive in understanding vulnerability and then tying those vulnerabilities to investments that we make in facilities and infrastructure and in cultural resources and historic structures, but also in what we do about natural resources that may be you know, affected as well, how much intervention is gonna be appropriate and necessary. That all requires investment. Um, uh, we can do some of that with, I think the resources that we have on hand and we're, we're shifting a lot of our efforts toward that because it's critical. Um, but again, I remain optimistic for two big reasons. One is that there's an enormous amount of collaborations occurring right now um, uh, with the different disciplines that need to, to work together on that and the possibility of, of applying some of the resources, some of the funds that are, that are available to help um, you know, do a sort of surge in some of this effort, some of this work. So that's what's going on. I, you know, yeah, like I said, cool. I'm encouraged, but it's a daunting task, no question. Very cool. Tom, how how do you um, think of the interrelationship here of nature and cultural in these uh, highly vulnerable sites? Um, not only how this prioritization happens, but um, in regard to the, uh, some would say vast resources of the National Park Service um, at a scale that could fit in some of these smaller countries, uh, World Heritage Sites. Um, how, how do you tie those things together? Any thoughts on that? Or Doug, please, any of you really jump in on yeah, this. Yeah, I'm, um... I wish I were smarter, but I ain't. <laughs> yeah, you are. <laughs> Not on those things. <laughs> I think I just have no idea. I mean, I think that you know, I'm I'm struck. I do think, as Ray was was saying, that the notion of climate vulnerability assessments are um, affect all of these resources, and I just have not tracked those budget accounts in the park service um, at all. You know, I don't know who out, who, how one could raise the, the, the advocacy profile of those accounts. Um, it could be done, but you would have to, you know, identify them with some particularity. Yeah. It's the, uh, I mean, obviously, this requires resources. I mean, Ray, I'm not that familiar with your program. I'd like to read all about it somehow um, and you know understand it much better. But working in countries that don't have the assets, um, you know, there are a couple of approaches. One is a, a lower tech approach, and then the other approach. And actually, I'm very interested in this. We've done some work with this. Is using aerial and satellite remote, especially satellite, because you know, you can do the analysis of the data that are collected by the satellites. And there's some kind of off the shelf algorithms that will enable you to track, you know, um, for example, the development of impervious surfaces, which is usually a big environmental consideration or the uh, propensity toward to, to fire, you know, areas that are more likely to burn. Um, in that case, the labor wouldn't necessarily have to come from the site itself. It would come from some central authority that would do run the algorithms uh, through the data, you know, sometimes in the cloud, and then provide the uh, the models that can be used. Other, so that's a promising approach. I think that we really haven't. Um, we really haven't followed up on, and I'm 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 always amazed that UNESCO hasn't <laughs> hasn't done more with this, um, because it's very promising. There are many many more satellite systems all the time, a lot more data, a lot more open source stuff, and so I think that's that's one possible track. 
and you again you wouldn't necessarily have to have the personnel that have the advanced technological training you just have to have people who know how to tap into the products that are generated uh, from the data by people who do have the training um, the other is to really you know the term that you use is um you know uh, vulnerability assessment i mean to really drill down into what are the most important factors uh given the resources give, given the uh the natural and cultural resources that are most important um, <clears throat> the design of monitoring program on that and then finally obviously given the fact that there are over a hundred or i'm sorry over a thousand world heritage sites you need a pilot program <laughs> you need to work with a few a few sites you know to demonstrate this and uh and um and then track how successful the effort has been and and what's worked and what what hasn't worked but it's this is desperately needed hmm. in so many world heritage sites around the world what you're doing yeah. it's just fast it's it's so hopeful really so is there a possibility of using the uh, sister park relationship that the park service has that also it also applies to some of the world heritage site parks like glacier bay and its sister park in finland um, to uh, scale the inventorying and monitoring uh, system applicability to serve both places or to take um uh, maybe maybe Finland already has a, a, a good INM capability, but certainly some of the places where the Park Service has sister park relationships with World Heritage Site parks, um, some of those sisters uh, are stepsisters. Um, you know, they don't have uh, all of the things that their their wealthy. Uh, uh, a relationship does so is there a way to build through the international program maybe through usaid or uh, the jeff uh, yeah. funding mechanisms to identify those places where um, world heritage site parks in the u.s can can partner with world heritage site parks elsewhere with similar resources um to uh to benefit them with uh, the expertise or uh, knowledge or techniques or tools uh, that we bring to bear now in in our parks. I think that's a I love that idea. <laughs> it, sure. In a sense, it's sort of an expansion of the uh, the networks, you know, that we're talking about at, uh, because there are there are plenty of similarities. It's amazing when you go to other places and other parks, um, the challenges are so similar and the ways in which those kinds of challenges can be addressed and measured and understood there's there's lots of overlap i i, I would also agree about the um the use of remote sensing and other kinds of of ways to um, collect information um there there is an enormous variety of new technological opportunities that that don't depend on having you know a bunch of people on the ground doing a lot of work um, that can still tell us a lot um, and I think we've only scratched the surface but it does take you know some investment of effort to kind of figure out what that looks like and what the protocols might be and how you serve up the information so there's 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 definitely the need for effort there but once those those programs I think get kicked off they're relatively easy to sustain um, because the information is is available and you know at the end of the day the, the the challenge i think also is very much what are the priorities what are the things that you want to be looking at specifically and it's always um it's always a tough choice because you don't have you know unlimited ability to look at everything um so prioritization is important um but there's also the i guess the good side is that there's almost all of these efforts are scalable at some level and so to the extent that you're able to prioritize effectively you can identify some key items that are particularly relevant and particularly important um, to focus in on and you know and ideally that means that you know your your investment may not be as as great so certainly that 
efforts I think are are scalable. Um, I wanted to touch on one thing that um, early on the conversation about monitoring, uh, periodic monitoring versus um, reactive or issue driven monitoring, and that's another I think another challenge that that in our own experience has been. Um, you know, much of the investment in the monitoring program in the national U.S. National Park Service has been on this periodic, consistent. You know, we have these protocols, but but sometimes if you're if you're struggling for resources, I think there still is really important and useful value to these issue-driven or reactive monitoring efforts, which sometimes are you know higher-level inventories, which is great and fine. It still points to really important information. And it may not require, you know, the sort of infinite investment of a periodic monitoring program that may appear daunting um, at the start um, if you're limited on resources. Well, I just want to mention this. When we use these words, periodic and, and reactive monitoring, the way UNESCO uses those terms is not the same as what you're describing. Periodic monitoring are the this is basically the state of conservation report that every world heritage is supposed to crank out every year. That's one thing. And then the reactive monitoring is sp sporadic. So when you're talking about periodic monitoring, I think you're talking about more frequent monitoring. You're talking about, you know, a schedule that is more frequent than once a year sending a you know, two people down to a World Heritage site and having them talk to people for three days, and that's the periodic monitoring. This is a different type of monitoring. Yeah. Um, and the reactive monitoring <clears throat> really the same way. I mean, I've seen some really good reactive monitoring missions, but they don't last that long, and there aren't that many people. And it's really, I mean, you're talking about, oh, we found a problem. Now let's let's take yeah. some resources and let's examine this. This, this problem in depth and come up with some, some solutions that's that scale is completely different than the way uh unesco talks about reactive monitoring and and it's good that they're doing this but it clearly is not enough the type of monitoring that you're talking about is really what's required to prevent uh you know to prevent the degradation of these sites um, you know, in UNESCO terms, would be the degradation of the authenticity and integrity of the criteria that that uh, made them eligible for inscription on the World Heritage List. But basically, we're just talking about the deterioration <laughs> of the environment and the physical environment as well, if it's a cultural site. Well, well, since we do do those periodic reporting uh, reports on the U.S. World Heritage Sites to UNESCO. Mm -hmm. um, what would be the possibility of uh, doing a, I don't know, an overlap comparison of the vital signs that you've already identified with the outstanding universal values that the UNESCO periodic reporting uh, keys off of and see where, um, see where the overlap is and use the, the mechanisms you already have in place for vital signs to speak to the OUVs hmm. uh, in the context of periodic reporting, and then take that as a model to these other countries um, as a way to um, get uh, both things done, get their own um, uh, consideration of the condition of their resources and uh, the reporting for that they have to do as well to UNESCO. I mean, it seems like there's got to be some overlap between vital signs and OUVs, um, um, the things that the park finds important to to inventory and monitor, as well as you know what the outstanding of values were that got the park designated you know, a World Heritage Site to begin with. Um, I don't know if that makes any sense, but there seems to be some overlap to me. Ab absolutely, and and I I would I, I think that there's there is a lot of opportunity, um, and th this is something I can go straight back to our inventory and monitoring coordinators and just say, hey, listen, make sure that you are aware of the potential for this overlap, and are there ways that 
um, because I think one of the critical and important values of, of inventory and monitoring data in general is its applicability to these kinds of things. And so we want to make sure that this information is being utilized, is being made available. And if there is an opportunity to connect the um, world heritage outstanding universal values with the results that are coming out of the inventory and monitoring work, absolutely, we should do that. And, and, and I would say even be creative about making, making sure that, that that linkage, that connection does happen. That's what the information is for, is exactly to um, provide insights into how are the values for which these areas were set aside and protected are being achieved, including things like outstanding universally universal values as identified by world heritage. Yeah. I think that's that sounds like a wonderful idea. It sounds, first of all, doable, <laughs> you know, without uh, a large inv greater investment. And of anything, or hopefully finance, finance uh, you know, money or labor, a time, um, and then also it's something that could be promulgated to ICOMOS, UNESCO, as an example, um, and could be a springboard for understanding how this could some of these monitoring protocols that you've developed could be adopted in other places. That sounds great. I think that sounds great. So, Ray, I, I heard through the grapevine recently that your Natural Resource Center out there in Fort Collins has hired a architect and an archaeologist, both to each to focus on climate change impacts for um, those uh, types of resources. Um, that would seem to to me to have great um, value to. Um, World Heritage Sites in particular, um, and, and especially so uh, around the world. So as as those people, if, if my information is correct, um, as, as those it people is. get, um, you know, fully engaged, um, you know, maybe we can draw on them uh, for thoughts about uh, ideas or advice or consultation you know, in helping uh, some of these vulnerable World Heritage Sites around the world that um, are, you know, principally architectural or archeological as opposed to biological. Um, that seems like a great move on the part of the, of the Natural Resource Center. Um, and and, and you, you're, the, the rumors are indeed correct. Um, that, so one of the programs that the National Park Service has, and you know, the, uh, ideally this is an interdisciplinary program. It's nested within the Natural Resources Directorate, but but we view it definitely as a, a sort of a, you know, like I said, an interdisciplinary, overarching um, support program. That's the climate change response program. So inventory and monitoring work has relevance, of course, with the information and data to understanding climate change. But the questions about what to do and how to respond and um, what sorts of uh, policy direction are appropriate and what kinds of technical support can be provided to parks around climate change, a lot of that is coordinated through the climate change response program. And the relevance of those challenges are across the board in parks. It's not just about understanding effects on natural resources. It's about understanding the consequences of environmental change, of climate change, on the full range of responsibilities that the National Park Service or parks in general have. So that's operations, it's visitor experience, it's historic resources, it's facilities and infrastructure, and it's also natural resources. But all those things, um, uh, benefit from, you know, obviously a, an understanding of, of how climate change is going to affect the responsibilities of park management agencies. The positions you're talking about are specifically designed for that purpose, to, to be working directly with their counterparts in climate change response, but with a focus on the implications of those issues for um, historic assets, 
archaeological resources and so forth. So yeah, that's that's exactly the um, the expectation. I saw a, a question in the chat about the investment review board and whether or not there were climate change criteria that were part of um, the uh, considerations that the investment review board makes. And the answer is yes. Um, they've been in place for a while, but we're also now working to um, develop more specific and um, tailored considerations for particular resource types that are at risk. And, and the, the, the kind of model for that is um, coastal, coastal resources uh, so that when questions come up about investments around, you know, on barrier islands, for example, that keep getting hit with increasing storm frequency and there may be campgrounds or roadways or other important historic resources um, uh, how do we how do we make decisions about investments and what are appropriate? Um, and the you know the investment review board often will have to grapple with well do we put twenty six million dollars into this you know rebuilding of an infrastructure whatever it may be um, given the risk associated with potentially losing that um, and is there a better way to do that? And so the, to coming up with a sort of set of questions and and criteria that superintendents at individual park units will will walk walk through um, to, to try to come to as informed a decision as possible given those constraints and given those challenges. It also is helpful because as we all know, the minute a storm comes through or the minute some kind of you know sort of climate related disaster may occur or challenge or impact, the 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 I think immediate desires to just well we got to rebuild it we got to put it back we got to we've got to restore it we've got to do you know we got to make it like it was before um and that may not be the right answer in fact we know it's not in some cases because of the trajectories and the futures that we have and so providing a basis a set of tools and a decision support um framework that park managers can use when the pressure comes to, you know, build this, redo that, um, we can, you know, in some ways arm um, our managers with the tools and the information they need to be able to push back on some of that and say, hey, we need to rethink this based on this kind of information. So that's, that, that is all a work in progress now, but for me, the good news is that there's a lot of serious thinking going on about that and, and ways to try to make that, um, to operationalize that in a, in a set of decision tools and a decision framework. But that's linking climate change information, the sort of natural science side of, you know, what are the trajectories and what are the impacts in the, in the you know, sea level rise projections or the temperature changes or the storm frequencies, the downscale models with you know, real nuts and bolts thinking about, well, what kind of assets do we have on the ground that are gonna be affected by that? And what are some of the factors? You know, who's using them, how frequently? Um, so a lot of these things come into play in those decisions. They're, they're more complicated, um, but, but you need to think about those things. Sure, although when you start turning uh, historic structures into archeological sites, you'll have a controversy on your hand. <laughs> And not a single one of these is without, <laughs> is without controversy, right? <laughs> right. So, uh, Tom, um, with all that Ray has said and, and others in these uh, presentations that have touched on climate change, you could almost declare any World Heritage Site uh, in danger um, with, from the effects of, of uh, climate change. You got to, I, I, didn't, pick, I didn't want to ask want, that question. But you want, to, you want to pick one? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that picking one would be, um, you know, Ray mentioned earlier, or, or perhaps Doug did, you know, a pilot project. And I think that right. there is merit to that. I think that particularly if we are successful in getting the funding through the uh, State Department for UNESCO and World Heritage that that would merit, you know, consideration and where could we 
have a pilot that would also use, you know, IUCN funding. Our our friends in the natural resource world have been, I think, more successful than have our our, our cultural resource constituency into tapping into those international funds of, of the government. Um, and I noticed there's just something in the chat here from Athlean, Athlein. Um, you know, many cultural resources are natural resources. So I think that there are opportunities to be creative, um, especially if we're successful in getting re-engaging with funding and membership of, of these international bodies. That's, that's an excellent point. I mean, having been working in the Western Pacific for some time, yeah. obviously there are incredibly severe and imminent dangers to the atolls out there, but even the high oh, islands yeah. oh, where, yeah. you know, we've been working at Namadal on Ponte, that's a high volcanic island. You think that would be less affected by climate change well for one thing when the sea level goes up it's going to draw on the site but secondly the alteration of the coastal environment makes will probably make it less productive it will certainly change it and usually the change is not good until you know there are natural adaptations and that takes a while and, and yeah. those are sources of food for a lot of people um you know not just on the high islands in Micronesia, but the changes in the coastal environments that are going to be um, reducing the productivity of those environments. That's going to be a really severe problem for a lot of a lot of people, a lot of a lot of you know indigenous heritage communities, because they depend upon that food. They really do. That's that's that's. That's their safety net, if nothing else. Sometimes, yeah, sometimes it's the only source of food they have. Right. So they're cultural resources. The natural resources, as as Athleen says, they're also the natural resources are cultural resources. Yep. I don't see any other questions in the chat at the moment or even in the Q and A box, um, where so, do we go from here? <laughs> I guess that's what's that. Where do we go from here? Yeah, this well, is something we might want to keep. In... No, I'm going to have to decide this very yeah, moment. Yeah. I mean, it's it's the end of a very long day, you know. But yeah. but at some point, um, thinking about where we would might want to go from here, that would be a good thing. Thanks. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, we, uh, you know, on the outside of government still have a job to do uh, at uh, demonstrating to others and to those in government that the world, the World Heritage Sites offer uh, the nation and the world, really, um, a, a set of models, a set of uh, examples uh, of finding the right balance in natural and cultural resource yeah. in integration and management and preservation. Um, and I think, you know, we need to continue to stress that and, and therefore, um, you know, have a role to play in uh, American diplomacy abroad right. that, that transcends just the simple sister park relations that a number of the World Heritage Sites have uh, and can be part of uh, of geopolitics in a, a non-defense oriented way. Um, uh, certainly parts of Africa and, and the Pacific uh, um, are places where it, it's appropriate for the US to be engaged through soft diplomacy with the world, um, and many cases through the the good things that the National Park Service in its international responsibilities can do, um, I, I know you know for many years, folks from the Park Service have been involved in things internationally, um, 
uh, I myself made three uh, Park Service related visits into the uh, old Soviet Union uh, at, at the time of Glasnost and before the present. <laughs> um, uh, and there was lots of opportunity for collaboration and yeah. resource uh, engagement, um, uh, you know, not just in um, the far Northwest of, of Alaska, um, but it seems to me that um, we need, we on the outside need more to generate more visibility for the values of these world heritage sites and the park service and its uh, hierarchy above it in the department um, need to grasp the fact that there's more to be done here that uh, that will utilize the fact of these world heritage sites to not only help with budgets and uh, FTE in the eyes of the Office of Management and Budget, but but also um, through State Department programs that can uh, and can provide money and international philanthropy uh, is not to be ignored. Um, a number of U.S.-based foundations, um, not the least of which is the Ford Foundation and several others do a great deal of international philanthropy for um, protected areas, natural and cultural. Um, and we should uh, try to steer some of that to these places that have yeah. uh, outstanding universal value. Well, I would concur, Destry, with your observations. And I would concur also with Doug's earlier comment that it's the end of a long day. Um, but as I know that as we are all looking forward to tomorrow in reviewing the agenda for tomorrow morning at 1030, there's a presentation um, by a guy that I don't know, but I know his firm well at 1030 on updates to the ICOMOS and IUCN on World Heritage and Impact Assessments. Mm. That seems to be closely related to the conversation that we're having right now. Yeah. So tune yeah. in. I shall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> and Leslie from the Getty will talk about threats to sites along the Mediterranean. So there's another area. Yeah, I think that, that requires visit. a site visit. Yeah, well, you never know. Okay. Never know. Okay. Um, I think Doug, um, with the, I still see no more questions in the in the chat. So let's uh, end this panel, and you can close out the day. Well, I just want to thank all the participants. This has been a remarkable day, starting with the National Park Service uh, morning program, which, which was incredibly informative. And I've been, I, we were hoping that there would be, you know, some commonality of interests. And, but I think this has exceeded at least my wildest expectations. <laughs> um, you know, at some point, I think we should be giving some thought to uh, ways forward, uh, what we do next, where we take all of this, and perhaps even coming up with some sort of a uh, document that would um, suggest some ways forward, uh, resulting from the kinds of collaborations that we've discussed today. Um, so with that, I'd just like to thank everybody. I think the presentations have been remarkable. The discussions have been remarkable. Uh, it's, it's been just, uh, you know, a, a treasure trove of ideas and, and information. So I thank you all. And I, and I'm sure many, well, all of us look forward to tomorrow. So Let's have a good evening and uh, looking forward to meeting again tomorrow.